Hey guys, welcome to the London Lift podcast. Today on the show, we have a very special guest, Mr. Shane Murphy. Shane is a coach working in professional football. He's had over a decade of experience with top clubs like Liverpool and Manchester City and international experience with Scotland and Wales. We talk about all things professional football. He's worked with a lot of the youth players at Man City as well. So we've got some great lessons learned from his experience and how you develop an athlete, but also the key metrics and priorities for developing them physically as they approach maturity and also comparing and contrasting the different types of issues facing male and female athletes as well as from his experience with the uh, female team at City. Um, it's not just for the footballers, though. There's plenty of general lessons around movement quality and how to put in structure around things that are harder to quantify and the overall indicators for success in successful athletes. So I think everybody will get a lot out of this. But before we get into it, please check out our website at lungeonlift.com. It's constantly being updated with good stuff. And we've got our four best deadlift accessories that you're currently not doing to download. This episode is also sponsored by The Training Stimulus, your one-stop shop for any movement mechanics education. Please check out the website, thetrainingstimulus.com. And as always, a big thank you to our show sponsor, Wit Fitness. Check out the website, wit-fitness.com. And also our blood flow restriction partner, Hytro. Use discount code LL15 at Wit and LL20 on Hytro. Right, that's out of the way. Let's get to it. <laughs> Shane, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing, mate? I'm very well. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Our pleasure. Um, and for the listeners who might not know who you are, please could you give us a quick intro as to who you are and what you do? Yeah, so my background is sports science, s and C. I've been predominantly in, in, in the world of football for the, vast, the last part of maybe 12, 13 years. I uh, worked at clubs like Blackburn, Liverpool, the Welsh national team, uh, uh, Man City and... And Scotland more recently, and I'm now set up my own company, SDM Performance. A little plug there on the on the shirt, and uh, so I've been kind of running that for the last two years in a bit of a venture to see how I see how I can how I can fare really with with the, the sort of entrepreneurial, self employed sort of things. Yeah, but so so far uh, I, I've you know as in with Scotland, I, I remain a performance consultant for the CFG, which is the company that owns Man City, New York, Melbourne, all those those other clubs. And with Atlanta College now as well, more of an educational sort of uh, area as well. So those three main things are my cornerstone, what I'm doing now, but it's predominantly football is my background. Brilliant. And how did you get into football? Was it just as a kid, you loved the sport and then decided you wanted to study it at uni? What was the story there? Yeah, well, if I go way back, and I won't go into it because it's a boring, boring enough story, but I didn't, you know, you're at that 17 age when you don't know what you want to do, like you haven't a clue. Uh, I, I in, in Ireland, you fill up a form to say which courses you want, and the first five of me were teaching, and then the sixth one was actually multimedia and computer game development, which I put down for a laugh, right? <laughs> anyway, as the offers come out, I don't get teaching. I end up getting the course I put down for a laugh, so I had to do it for a full year, and just being like in total denial that this is what I want to do, but anyway... I pulled the handbrake on that a little bit, and then sport was my thing, football was my thing, and I found out you could actually be a sports scientist. I didn't know that was a, a, a job existed. I saw someone with Glasgow Celtic was was a sports scientist from there, and I thought that's the that's the job for me. That's what I would love to do. I, I always wanted to be a footballer. On it very quickly, I couldn't be one. So working in football, working in sport was an ambition of mine. So that's how I kind of got into it, if you like. I always played football, but yeah, once I heard there was a career in it, I kind of just did everything I possibly could to, to make a career in it. Amazing. And so you worked at Man City. That's when I met you first, you were working at Man City, which is a very difficult place to get a job. Can you tell us a little bit of the process? Of how did you manage to weasel your way in there? Not weasel my way in. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's, a good, that's a good term. Um, yeah, so I think... Um, you obviously have to build up a bit of a reputation. So I, I first got into like I mean the hardest um, step for me was going from not in football to into football. I think that's mm. the hardest one mm. because so many people are are similar to you at that point. Uh, thousands and thousands of you, or millions maybe, uh, are at the same point of view, and uh, so it's getting over that threshold was the first part. So I basically took a, a leaf out of Roy Keane's book where he um, I think he wrote letters to. 
I don't know how many clubs he was to try and get himself a trial. I emailed uh, 72. I remember I have still a list in my room, 72 clubs uh, that were in, in, in England, they were in uh, France, they were in Spain, they were in uh, Italy, Germany. Just anyone I could find, literally scouring the internet hours and hours, emailing the clubs, doing a, an email of what I can offer, blah, 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 blah. And at the time, Real Madrid and Barcelona couldn't afford me, so uh, I obviously uh, <laughs> that did. I did. So basically, Everton and, and, and Cardiff were the two clubs, and, and Everton said no. And uh, the only two clubs that got back to me now, I have a 72, so two clubs got back to me. And Cardiff were like, well, we don't have a sports science, but we have a performance analyst sort of role. So I went there doing performance analyst for eight months now, and I sort of weaseled my way into doing <laughs> sports science that way. And then from there, it sort of... You know, you build your momentum. So it was Cardiff, it was Blackburn, it was the Welsh team, it was uh, Liverpool. And then you kind of have yourself, uh, you're kind of narrowing up the pyramid a little bit. You're mm. kind of a smaller entity of people then. And I suppose then when a job like Man City comes about, you, you're kind of in a, in a better place to get something like that. Uh, but I think Amazing. the biggest transition is going from a student to like a practitioner. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And I think it's something that a lot of people who get into S&C aspire towards a lot of people get into strength and conditioning hoping to work in professional sport and um yeah that making that leap from sort of normal fitness i guess into professional and elite sport is difficult so it's very impressive that mm. you yeah you roy keen your way in there i think that's a good lesson roy keen my way in, yeah, when, yeah. <laughs> there's something to be said oh sorry yeah no, go on go karen. karen no i was just going to say there's uh, i think some people um don't realize the utility in working not just with elite athletes for a while you know is developing your coaching voice your coaching eye your just coaching experience you know so there's a lot to be gained from just being a coach early doors okay you want to fast track your career and go straight into it we all want that of course but that's not always going to happen so you've got a choice to make you either be bitter about that decision and don't look at the opportunities around you and learn as much as you can from the people you are working with or you, you do choose to take on the responsibility of where you are now and, and then try and get yourself to where you want to get to because they're, they're the options for me. And I think too many people expect to get into sport very quickly because they're sporty and they love it and there's no one as passionate as them and all that. But there's, you know, there's thousands of people that are like all mm. of us, you know. So I think you have to take the opportunities that are around you first and then build that as a, as a, as a, as a reference point. Because, like, okay... The story I painted there was like a nice one going from UL, or sorry, UL was the university I went to, into Cardiff City and blah, blah, blah. But at Cardiff City, like I was painting the railings. I was almost mowing the lawn at points. You know what I mean? I was doing everything I possibly could. Like it wasn't just a fancy, it wasn't like football is not, okay, it's sexy on the exterior, but it's not all glamorous, mm. you know, to work in it. So you have to, you have to put the hard yards in, I think. Uh, is the most important and whether that's at Cardiff paint railings or whether that's at a football club an amateur level you know taking warm-ups there's so much you can you can gain from just that alone you know did you do much coaching then before because as you said there you kind of went from university university straight into then Cardiff did you manage to get any type of real life coaching before that and have you had you built up a bit of as you said there you know like understand your coaching voice and stuff like that or has that just been pretty much since you got into football then that's where you started to find your voice and how you want to kind of get your message across yeah that's a good question um i probably i, I had a little bit of it before i even get into uni i i just i just enjoyed like i would say i was captain of a team so i had to like um take the warm right that was a mm. little mini introduction to it then when i went to U, U university they had modules i was coaching i was very much into coaching and kind of that so that was that and i took on a team so i, I took I, I took on a team voluntarily when i was in college and then i went to america and i i, I coached at a an academy a soccer academy so it was like slowly building yeah. it nothing formal really but it's probably just it was probably always there just slowly chipping away at it and um yeah always just enjoyed the coaching kind of element to it but I think, as you said there, it's like you still pretty much in exactly what you wanted to do, you know, going over to America to then coach a soccer team and there. Think, so you was pretty much going towards where you wanted to get to. As you said, you're doing what you needed to, even if it included painting railings, to get yourself yeah. in through the door. Because then it's how I, how I become a personal trainer when I was at Virgin Active. At I, I There was no one taking on, no jobs at the, at the time at Virgin Active, but I managed to get a front of house assistant role. So I was basically mm -hmm. just receptionist. So people walk in. So for about six weeks, that's what I did. 
And then I met, then there yeah. was a brand new one, brand new club opening up, which was their flagship club, which I managed to become a fitness coach, work my way through them, work my way all the way up and, you know, through to head coach and then left the business. But sometimes you do have to do things a little bit of a sidestep to get that foot mm. in the door. Because it, uh, even yeah. as you said, there are so many people out there, super passionate and especially in fitness, it's like most people that get into fitness, there's a backstory behind it. And then there's a real passion that gets them into and keeps them there. So, you know, you are competing against a lot of people just like yourself. So yeah, you always yeah. have to have it back in your mind. I think yeah, it's an appreciation we, of all the levels as well, doesn't it? So mm. Shane. Yeah, no, you're, you're dead right. Yeah, that's another point. Now, I'm also going to say is that unfortunately, I think you say the younger, say, coach coming up now, you've got the influence of social media where everyone looks like everyone's going to show their shiny exterior, right? Everyone's mm. going to feel like they're the best coach and they have the best job and they have the best thing. And you go, look where I'm at. I'm miles mm. off that. I'm working at this. And it's so false. And I think they just need to get away from that. And it's probably nice to share stories of like the hard yards that you have to do, but they, they almost make you a little bit, you know, like I, I could go into other stories of Blackburn and Liverpool that didn't go too too well for me. It was it was struggling at times, even though I was at these massive clubs. And it wasn't only till I hit Man City when the kind of momentum started to shift in my favour and things started to go well for me. But it is definitely a no matter where your your entry level is to wherever you want to get to, there's there's hard yards to be done. And um, and I would say that that is the that is the bit that builds the resilience, that builds the character, that builds the kind of personality in your coaching as well as just like if you're everything's handed to you I, I don't think that's good yeah I think as Ash started to then elaborate as well it's that thing of getting yourself in it and gives you that appreciation of all the levels up the ladder and for me one of the things that I loved about when I was in a head coach was because I'd been the fitness coach I'd been the front of the house I'd been those all the dudes in between that I kind of understood what it was like for that person. So like being in the front of the house, like having someone coming into the club and asking about personal training and then call, okay, what kind of questions are they coming with? I'd had those people asking me because I think when you mm -hmm. do have, say, just another trainer telling you, okay, cool, this is how to do it, they may not have had the direct questions that a front of house assistant would get because at the end of the day, someone that's talking to a personal trainer probably has their guard up because they don't want to be sold to straight away. Whereas with a front of house mm. assistant, they're probably asking more genuine questions and they're, they're inquiring more about like fitness. So it's, it's kind of a nice thing to have to be able to appreciate all these different levels along and then also see what you don't like. Sometimes you realise that actually, yeah. actually I've got to take a step back yeah. still in football because as you said, when you went in as a, then an analysis, that is an actually, that was just like the way in to then get across to where you want to be. Mm. So Yeah, exactly, Please. exactly. So, um, so when you got to City, Shane, um, so I think a lot of people are curious about the inner workings of elite sport and the Premier League. Could you tell us what your role was and um, yeah, how did it evolve over time and sort of the experiences you had mixing it with the uh, top tier football? Yeah, so when I first joined, uh, it was a nice project, really. I, I'd worked with more older athletes, more senior and then maybe 23s level sort of thing. So when I first joined Man City, I actually was in at the real lower uh, ages of the academy under 12s to under 16s i was leading that court and, and the reason why that was nice is that one is obviously the amount of um benefit your training can have at that age and the amount of opportunity you have to develop an athlete at that age versus say, a more senior pro is more right now okay there's got players there who won't make it but you got players there who could make it right so um that cohort was special because they had the likes of phil foden they had the likes of brahim diaz they had like Jaden sancho phil and Jaden plays for for man united now mm -hmm. brahim plays for ac milan and then obviously you know phil foden plays for man city currently so they were a very strong core and even the players around that there were some very good championship level players and some in the premier league now they're a really strong cohort right and the, and, and, the, and the question was how do we prepare prepare this cohort because they're so so superior in their you know around the, around England? How do we prepare them for the for the Premier League? So like in five six years time when they actually make their debuts, are they going to be ready physically? So we uh, the project was to try and kind of predict the future, I suppose, with the stats with the data that's out there. So we could look at the Premier League, we could look at the last five years, six years, seven years, and you do a regression analysis into what would look look like in the future. Um, and when we did that, it was quite accurate, actually, what it <laughs> turned out to be. So we knew we were chasing a moving target, right? So we knew we weren't chasing the Premier League as it currently existed. We were chasing what it was going to look like in five, six years' time. So then we had to build a program around that. Now, it's not that you water down that and, and then get players to run like crazy, but you have to have appreciation for where you're trying to get them to and find out what trajectory they are. They are on a 12, 
you know yourself like um you can use once you know the end goal and what it needs to look like and you know where you are at a certain point in time you can predict what is the likely trend of your your trajectory you know so we did that and we made sure that our training was appropriate that when they get to the first team that they're ready for what the Premier League may look like so that was the kind of the role there 12 to 16s did that for three years then moved on to the 23s and then I saw I basically saw their that cohort all the way up into the first team because I was there with them all the way up to 16 then they skipped and I obviously I skipped an age group 18s but I saw most of them on the 23s because they moved up quite quickly and then I was with the 23s then for three years as well and then I saw them all the way into the first team which is which is perfect which is like a really nice kind of mm. it doesn't always happen like that it, it's very unique I would say so it's a nice narrative to say I've, I've worked with some of these players from under 12 all the way into the first team and it was nice to see that and then you can reflect on a lot of things you've done where, where you made mistakes what, what you know how things how, what what was really good uh, how you handle these guys through their their maturity um, which is a crucial thing to do um yeah so all these kind of lessons were learned from that and then as i decided to leave the club i actually stayed about six months later which allowed me to kind of be a moving part within an organization so i went around with the first team i was with the first team on a pre-season tour uh, i was spent a bit of time with them then i went with the women's team spent six to eight weeks with with, the, with that squad and then back into the under 12s again before i left so it was kind of a full sort of nice. breath of, of of squads within within man city which is wow well, i couldn't think of a better club to do that within you just see so much talent and so much different um sort of uh, challenges i guess you, know, you look at the women's team like a completely different kind of um outlook obviously they play the, play the same sport but if you even look at the injuries alone they're very very different in their profile and they have to be trained accordingly um so um yeah so th- that was kind of my my kind of my journey i suppose at man city amazing so many things i want to pick up on mm-hmm. in there i guess like the first thing that jumped out was what are the key things you're looking for in that gap analysis between the youth players and where they need to get to when they get to the Premier League like what sort of metrics and measures are you, have you got to make sure that they're progressing towards being ready yeah, for the, f- the Premier League the first thing was identifying what elite training looks like what what a mindset is what a behavior is so how like how are you're a 14 you're the best player on the team You've no reference to what's ahead of you. You have the 18s, you have some of them, but you obviously think you're better than them. You have no, like, Vincent Company, you've no David Silva, you've no, you don't see what they do. Per day. You don't know what elite looks like yet. You're, okay, you're, you're a good footballer, but that's, not, that's nothing at 14. That's nothing. So we have to kind of somehow educate these players into, like, what, how you look after yourself. What is it about that you, you know, the mindset, the preparation, the food, the hydration, the sleep, all these kind of things. They were, they were the tools of their armor that we have to educate them over, over time, not, not just in a presentation or a poster on a wall, but make it, let them fail and then call them up on their failure and go, like, this is what happened. And then maybe drop them at times and maybe, maybe make the gym a little bit more harder environment for them, right? There's nothing set up. You're going to have to, like, the gym is, I'm not here as a conditioner anymore. You're just going to have to do your own gym. Like, who chooses not to do it? Who chooses to do it? What do they do? I, I even left a um, uh, hidden camera in the gym before, and I said, right, lads, we're back in five minutes. And I just wanted to watch what the outcome was within the group. It was so interesting. It was, this was Phil's age group as well, and you, you have the initial, like, uh, checking out their biceps in the mirror, the, and peeing about, I don't know if I can swear, but peeing about yeah. uh, on the on the in in the gym, or whatever. And then after a while, then it's like, right, okay, no one's coming. Uh, what are we going to do? You know, you can see the moment when that happens, and you can just see the ones that gravitate. Or oh, I have to do this, I have to, and it's amazing to, to watch it. Uh, it's, it's such a good um, video I have. Uh, but anyway, um, so it was that was the first thing, and that was really important that we educated them on that because that were they were the tools that were going to last them their career. I think. Um, and then it was about looking at just training as a whole, you know, like metric wise, but then qualitatively, so quantitatively, how far off we were in a week, uh, but also qualitatively. So how, how you get the metrics is uh, as important as what metrics you get, you know, so I can do straight line run, I can do box to box runs, right, for instance, so that I can get loads of high speed meters and you go, okay, look, we've matched the high speed meters of the Premier League, but you haven't, you've got the metric, but you haven't got 
the the softer stuff you know so you know like x doesn't equal y you know so how do we get them in training so are we blending the technical the tactical the physical the psychological are we getting the metrics out then then we're closer to the game as opposed to just going just do a random few runs and then hopefully that pieces it together and look 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 on one dimensional we're the same but actually three dimensionally we're miles off mm-hmm. it because we're not actually near the game really um so yeah, it's those Great. those two things I think were the were the priority. Yeah, the specificity is key, as we always say. Yeah. Um, and what about the differences in injuries between female footballers and male footballers? Interested to hear more about that. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, I I did a blog recently. It was uh, the injuries leave clues, right? So um, your sport your sport denotes the injuries you could get, right? So you play football. These are the injuries you could get, you know, so it's obviously a lot of lower limb, but you could get a concussion, you could dislocate your shoulder. Typically, there's a few up, upper body ones and, and head injuries you get, but, but predominantly it's lower limb injuries. You play golf, it's a completely different set of injuries and, and so on. You can pick any sport, right? So the sport donates the amount of injuries. Then the mechanism narrows that down. So the, of the amount of injuries that you have, what mechanism do you have or is happening that will narrow down those ones again so say if i sprint i'm probably not going to dislocate my shoulder but i could pull my hamstring i could pull my ankle i could uh, do my ankle in rotation whatever i saw the mechanism and then after that then the mechanism the biomechanics play a huge role right so how your biomechanical makeup determines whether you get injured or not basically so you and me play a sport we play football we have the same mechanism we both for go for a tackle a block tackle we both have the same mechanism same force imagine if everything's equal and i blow out my mcl and you don't why biomechanical differences there right so so females obviously play the same sport as the males uh they have similar mechanisms but they have sort of a different profile of injuries the prevalence of the injuries are different right so there's more uh joint based injuries in the females game i would say if i'm if i'm going to summarize them, i'm going to be crude about it okay i'm not saying there isn't muscle injuries but there's more acls there's more ankle injuries and and if you take the red pill and phil manfield stuff about you know the lent tension relationships and you talk about those people that are more susceptible to uh more joint based injuries are those people who have are hypermobile are on the lent side of things they lack tension and end range and the joint creates the stability for them that's basically what's happening and obviously with females with the q angle you have a higher um higher forces at the knee more torque at the knee because of it and they 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 sort of um those two factors kind of play a role in the in the prevalence of those injuries um, could you just explain but, the q angle please i'm not sure the listeners will be so so your, your hip the typically wider hips than males which creates a larger top angles even hips down to the knee so create sorry you can't see my hands there mm-hmm. so like the wider hips yeah. then it creates a, a bigger bigger angle as if or if you've got narrow hips it's more of a straight line down to the knee so you have a yeah. you have a difference in um in angle there just biomechanically and there's nothing you can do about that so it predisposes the knee to to so I suppose the knee injuries and then couple that then with hypermobility and joint stability being the the, the major um, sort of mechanism behind behind stabilization, you, you leave yourself open to those type of injuries. How did you find working with the female football? I know it was only for a brief period of time, but did it leave you kind of wanting more or was it like, actually it was a good experience, but I'm, I'm looking to kind of come back across to basically what you already know. Just the only reason why I ask yeah. is because <clears throat> I've I've found personally training women over the years has has been a diff, different different approach for me and I've always enjoyed kind of that that challenge but when it comes to say the nutrition side of stuff because there's so much going on with a, a female I nearly always refer out mm-hmm. because there's just there's so much and because it's such a specialist thing did you find yeah. that in in that because of those differences it was too much of a, a specialist thing that you probably need to give more time to yeah, I, I definitely felt I didn't uh, didn't turn over every stone. I felt there's more like I scratched the surface. Been there six eight weeks, but I suppose I always liked the challenge. Like even when I took over the twelve sixteens, like you you talking about a child versus a senior athlete, mm. completely different. There's so many different milestones. There's growth maturation. There's peak high velocity. There's so many things going on, and you so you have to embrace yourself, embed yourself in that in that in that sort of cohort to, to really figure it out and i love that mm. same when you go to senior senior men's you have like now injury history plays a huge role in, in some of the decision making 
And then when you go to the females, it's completely different again. So injury plays a role, you know, all the biomechanics play, play a role. So, uh, yeah, it, it left me, suppose, with more questions and answers. I, I love my time with the women. They were, so, they were such a good cohort of, of people to work with. Mm. They were so enthusiastic, really want to drive on the, the, the women's sport in football, for sure. They're... Um, they're just nice people to work with, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, I would have spent a longer time if I could have done, but um, I, I do work with a, a, an athlete, a female athlete, a female footballer. So that's kind of given me, that's filled a void a little bit for me. Mm. I've kind of started to figure yes. her out a bit more. Um, so that's that's quite good. Um, but yeah, so it, it, six weeks, eight weeks is not a long enough mm. time to, to really figure out what's going, what's going on. Mm. And with, with that experience with the female players and the youth players and then also exposure to the first team players as well, what are the commonalities between the athletes that are excelling in each of those spheres? Because they're obviously quite different physically. What would you say the common yeah. threads are for the people who do really well? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I, I did a recent sort of a presentation just around, so, um, yeah, I suppose the... the the, the kind of top one percent, top two percent of of, sort of the athletes that I've worked with, and there's there's probably five traits that I would say sort of come out and and are quite consistent around uh, around uh, those athletes, even whether we're men's, whether we're with the academy, whether with the international setup now with Scotland, you just see it within them, right? And the first one is they're highly motivated, right? They're highly intrinsically motivated. You ask them what they want, they'll tell you what they want. They know exactly what they're up for, what they're here for. They don't, ah, I'm here for whatever. They're not, that's not them. The top ones know exactly what they want. I want to win the World Cup. I want to I want to win this medal. I want to do this. I want to win the Champions League or whatever. They've set goals, right? And they're highly motivated. They have a plan. They have an action. And they will move people out of the way if they have to, um, you know, to get what they have to get. To. So they're completely motivated, I would say. Very intelligent in their environment. So if I take Phil Foden, right, so if you were to do setting him in an exam, he's not going to do very well in an exam or in school or in studies or whatever. But on the pitch, he's probably one of the most intelligent footballers I've ever come across in my life. Just knows the game inside out, knows the pass to make, decision making is incredible. So intel- intelligent for the environment they are, they're in. Highly stress tolerant, can handle a lot of things going on at once. You know, the press, the media, games, uh, losing injuries, all this kind of stuff. And it obviously family matters and all that. Very, very good with, with that kind of thing. They're usually persistent and they just keep going. They don't give up. Like, you know, they get setbacks. They handle they handle adversity well. They're just really persistent in their in their, in their process. And this is this is something I've taken from, say, like a Jordan Peterson kind of chat. Is, is, and it's so true, is they're fast. They get there quick. Do you know what I mean? Like, like he he talks about life as a game, right? And it's those who get their first win. Do you know? So like these people don't win. Like uh, if I use Jaden Jaden Sancho as an example, right? So he was at Man City. He wanted to make it into the first team. Now he wants to get there so fast, so quick, so determined, so motivated. I ask you, what do you want, Jaden? I want to play for Man City. I want to play in the first team. I want to play. I want to win the Premier League or whatever it is, right? So he basically knocked on the manager's door and said, the manager's door, even at 17, and said, are you going to play me next season? And the manager was obviously thinking, well, I've got Leroy Sané, I've got Bernardo Silva, I've got Sterling, you know, you're going to have to buy your time. And Jaden wouldn't wait for that. Do you know what I mean? He just mm. wanted success, he wanted the game time, so he left, he went to Dortmund. And then, you know, so these players, I think the elite ones want it now, they want it fast, and they mm. get there quickly, you know, um, because they know that someone behind them is going to take over their, their place quickly. So I would say they're the five traits that I see in, in, in the elite athletes that, that, that really that really separate themselves, a, a lo- along with good movement patterns. If you want to go down to the kind of stuff that we kind of control a bit more, for sure, they move very well. Uh, if you watch Phil Foden's movement, incredible mover. Um, but I would say mindset probably overrides the movement. Yeah, that seems to be the the common theme for all elite athletes is the thing that unites them is mostly in the head mm. rather than mm. physicality or anything like that. But yeah, for those uh, the people who really make it to the top. Yeah, because um, when you look at, say, when you think about like CrossFitters and they say like <clears throat> the main difference is like Matt Fraser would say like at the end of the day, there's everyone, everyone that are like me. We're all doing the same thing. We're all working as hard as each other. You know, some people might be working even harder, but at the end of the day, when, say, he stepped onto the competition floor, that was his opportunity to say, right, I'm going to do me. I'm going to work as hard as I can and perform the best that I can because that was in his head all he can control because they are the only controllables. So especially when it comes to the footballer, is it's slightly more, obviously, 
in depth because they've got so they've got to deal with reactions at the moment what's happening and they have to be able to adjust on the fly but as you say the mindset to kind of stay cool when you've got this stressful moment or you're you're three nil mm. down or something like that, and you're like i've got to kind of pull the team together and that's when you see a lot of the leaders of like the proper captains of the teams like say company was an example it was a it was a great captain for city and you just see some of like that being able to kind of rally your team and kind of bring that mindset of like no let's finish strong and finish together and you know perform yeah, I think that stress tolerance stuff is so important because it's a it's a pressure cooker, right? That you, mm. you have to perform, and so if you're going to be one of the top percent, you have to do things that you know only one percent of people can do. Really, you're going to have to like take on a challenge when all it doesn't look likely that you're going to win, or it doesn't look it's not in your favor. You've got to overcome so much adversity to make it to that level. So you've got to like take on the responsibility first of all, and you've got to take on the challenge. And yeah, you just kind of have to. Yeah, I, I, people say it's a fear of failure. I think that's part of it as well. But it's more like tolerance to the fear. You know, you can just you can just overcome it. You know, um, it's always going to be present. It's not like these guys don't doubt themselves, or it's not like these guys don't have fear. It's not like they're human beings. They're not special. You know, they're not they're not like freaks of nature. If you know what I mean, they're not they're wired the same as us. Mm. But they just have a tolerance to overcome it. Um, I think. Yeah, leaning into discomfort. That's how I like to think of it. Um, yeah. So Chain, I want to ask you more about the Scotland experience. You went to the Euros, which must have been a great experience. Could you yeah. tell us how your role changes when you're in tournament from a SNC point of view? In tournament versus just like in in season yeah. camp, is it? You mean? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. with yeah, so so with the in season camps, obviously you have um, in football. But those do not know the international break happens uh, four times a year, pretty much. So you have your August, September, you have your October, November, and then March again will be the times. Now they they fall in between the preseason uh, Premier League calendar, for instance. So the players will have a break, and then so basically you 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 we we probably call it like you borrow the Rolex for twelve days, and you give back the Rolex after twelve days. You don't try and fix it and change it and make it new, and mm. you know you just polish it up a little bit, make it nice, give it back. So. In that time, you are you are just kind of supporting, facilitating players going through that journey. I think one of the biggest things that we do is monitor the players quite religiously all through the season. Find out like uh, how many, what's their game time, when's their last game, have they played? You know, say say the schedule we might get in an international window is uh, three games in eight days or whatever. How many players are used to doing that kind of schedule? How many players can recover that quickly or are proven to recover that quickly before? How many players have never done it? How many players have played 90 minutes back to back? How many, you know, all these kind of little answer questions that you may have, the manager may have. We, we cover like 40 players and then we give all this information to the manager in a readable, meaningful way. He's able to make decisions. Then off the back of the decisions that he makes, we can then narrow down our monitoring and then we kind of know, all right, this player played on Saturday. He shouldn't train on Sunday or Monday. Or he can mm-hmm. train on Tuesday. He normally has a match of minus two. These are his metrics that he typically gets. And trying to keep the environment a seamless way you know that they're used to in their clubs and then they're better prepared for the games obviously um uh, scotland have a maybe a different philosophy to to some of the clubs i mean you're not gonna have the same philosophy as 25 clubs so we just have to get across our message but then try and get our across our message in the right way in terms of when they're ready to train right so that's what we're our essence role is is in in season when you didn't have a, a, um, a european qualifier which is uh, very, very similar in some ways and very, very different in other ways. So you have Scotland have a, are a nation where you have players playing across five different tournament or competitions, right? So you have the Premier League, you have uh, we had a Belgium uh, player, we have the ch- Championship, we have the Scottish Premier League, we have the Scottish Championship, right? So you've got a lot of clubs, uh, a lot of tournaments finishing at different times in the season, and now what that means is then players are on a break then until the Euros. So you have to map out what each player is going to do on their introduction to train. So when are we going to start camp for our mm. our Euros? And what's everyone player's trajectory? So, okay, they might finish on the last game of the season, but they might actually just be recurring from injury. So they don't need time off or they may need time off or whatever it is. So you're, you're, you're trying to map out each individual journey to a point where you can go, right, everyone's on a similar page now and we can just train again. So sometimes there's patience needed. Sometimes there's a little bit of intervention needed. 
Uh, but then once you re reach the camp phase, then you're hoping that everyone's on a similar page and then you can do a bit more training, you can do a bit more gym work or whatever it might be, uh, but leading into the game. But it's very much trying to map out the journey uh, of the player. So the destination is the same, but everyone's journey is so different. Um, and you have to kind of uh, realize that, I suppose, uh, even into Euros. But it's just a larger window now, um, you know, yeah. into the Euros than it is in, in the... In it seems the like season. a massive... It seems like a massive challenge compared to club football, where you've got control over their mm. schedules, sort of for the whole season, pretty much. But obviously, the international breaks if they're internationals. How did you develop that skill set to to like factor in all the different players' individual needs and in seasons? Yeah, what helped me a lot was having done Wales before, so I worked with the Welsh national team for a while, so I kind of figured it out a bit more with that one i mean right this is not the same kettle of fish here all clubs do different things players are used to so many variety how do you manage it all and you basically you monitor it so you paint the biggest picture the best picture you possibly can and that was my first sort of um idea of how to manage it properly um and then how you feed that back to the people who make the decisions is is very important you know how do you without trying to say you run the show or you're trying to dictate what they do, but you're trying to just give the right people the right information at the right time so they can make the right decisions, basically, is my I, how I see it. And having done it with Wales a little bit and working with different managers, you kind of get a feel for what's right, what's appropriate, what's what's needed. And I think, you know, I've been at Scotland now over a year and a half, and you kind of tend to know how people work and, and, you know, we've got a good relationship with the manager now and he trusts what we, we give him. And, you know, so far the, the, the outputs in games have been good and the injuries have been quite low for an international setup. So I think that's paying dividends, that, that sort of information mm -hmm. gathering and, and information sharing. Has just out of curiosity for <clears throat> talking about coming into like the strength and conditioning side of things, um, how does what does a are there some basic principles that you follow when it comes to uh basically like coaching strength like gym based strength training through the different ages so when you was at city kind of pulling it back to there you obviously introduced the younger kids to say the gym and you say like cool this is what you're going to need to do how does that kind of change as you progress up and does it always kind of follow the same principle and if our li our listeners may not be professional footballers, but they like to play football to say a good weekend high level or five side, is there anything that they can kind of make sure they incorporate within their training that they might not already be doing that they do at the pro level that you can think of? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So at Man City, uh, you have so many players, right? You have mm. such big squads, you have limited resource in terms of staff. So you have to develop a strategy to um i suppose ensure that everyone gets the right program so we had a uh snc syllabus right that we had a curriculum we called it so we had um eight 11 categories of exercises right so you can categorize um exercises into like double leg single leg split stance posterior chain oblique slings um jumping and landing um yeah anyway 11 categories and then of the 11 categories then we classified as level one level two level three level four level five and level six right so what would a push pull was the other ones mm -hmm. so uh, and and some core stuff so we basically were able to um screen players on like how well do you squat for instance so do you squat well do you lunge well do you uh, pull well do you push well do you hip hinge all these kind of stuff right so we go through and then we, we saw you're a level one on your squat because you can't really squat so it's an assisted squat you have but you can actually you're a very strong upper body so you have an upper body pull up uh, and you have a loaded press up for instance because you're quite strong upper body so so each each player was was somewhere along that um, curriculum for each of the 11 categories and then basically of the 11 categories you had a six exercise and a five exercise program once a week so uh, on a tuesday you do your six exercises on a, on a thursday you do your five exercises right so what it, what it enabled us to do was just monitor and look and, and program for players based off their movement competency mm. early on. So I was always kind of unloaded or limited load. Like a, sometimes a little bit of load actually helps a movement as we as we know, Ash, from our red pill days. So you, you have to 
sometimes you you do load a little bit, but it's not heavy loading. Do you know what I mean? It's so it's a little bit of a load. And then um, so once the players got to a level six on some of the exercises, then we got into the point of like now we're actually doing some lifting. Now we're actually going to load up this in a sort of a a strategy of a five by five or whatever it might be. So you basically brought the players through this level of competency. And then once they were past the level and you knew they were good, a component mm. at these lifts, then they could start loading. So basically you ensured good movement was, was seen first. There was a bit of a moving capacity and also kids nowadays, they're, 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 they're moving less, they're playing less, they're, you know, they're, mm. everything's more formal. There's more screen time. The sleep. So all these things factor into like movement li- being limited. So you want to widen the base as much as you can. So 11, 11 exercises sounds like a lot, right? But when you have a 12 year old, it doesn't move a lot. You know, I used to climb trees and play yeah. in bales and, and all of the country boy, right? So, but I don't think these kids play enough, even if you're out no. the country, you know, uh, you don't play, you don't do a, a climate, like a tree for me was something to climb. I don't know if kids look at trees the same way anymore. Um, they're just things that birds fly on. But um, so I, I think they, they lack some movement. Uh, so mm. I think, edu- uh, and it is formal movement. I know that. I know it's, it's not movement necessarily. It's, uh, but from the younger ages, we, we made like mini playgrounds where they would jump and tumble and roll. And tr- Actually, there's some really worrying and interesting signs coming out now around um, primary school kids' movement. They, I don't know if you've seen this research. It's, 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 it's it's, it's worrying as a parent now. It's, it's awful to see. So 16% of kids can overhead throw properly. And only, I think it is three thirds of people, or 30, three, three, three quarters of people can actually run properly, you know, of 12 year old mm. kids. Like, which is shocking, really, because mm. what that does then is when they leave school and they leave college, if you can't have the, if you don't, if you can't throw, all throwing sports are out your window, right? If you can't run, all running sports are out the window. If you can't do certain the fundamentals of that sport, you're not playing that sport. You know how many, how, how often have you seen people in the road running? You're like, that's just mm. a shocking run. And now that's leading to injuries. That's leading, and, and now it's getting worse. So we're going to have a core of people who've not developed good movement skills that are not going to train later on, and obesity levels are already on high. Screen time is on the high. It's just, it's just not good, right? Um, and so basically, with that in mind, uh, digress this slightly there. Uh, we we had a movement competency was what was our primary goal, and I would say that's the same for for someone you know uh, an amateur athlete. Like move well first before you start going to lift loads and do Nordics and all that stuff. So I, I yeah, so I love about that as well is the fact that <clears throat> just quickly on the kids thing, I think especially now you're a new dad as well, is one of the most important things I see with my daughter is to make sure that she sees me train, she sees me train other people. So she sees movement as a normal thing and she's you know, she's already <laughs> competitive, she she already knows she's throwing, she's running, she's she's climbing things and we're having to make sure she's climbing things kind of safely, but at the same time she's a kid, right? You gotta <laughs> let you gotta let them fall. And it's funny because yeah. I, I literally a couple of weeks ago, I said to the missus when we were driving along, I said, I remember going past this green and falling out of that tree. And I said, now mm. you just see people sitting in circles on their phone. You just don't see the climbing of the trees. And it just doesn't no. happen as much. And it's just, it's no. just that everything, everyone's being like babied and like, you know, you've got to be really safe. And, but on to the point yeah. itself, yeah. I absolutely love like that graduation of like, you have to get to there before you can move on to the next bit. I think that's amazing. And I think it's a really nice, across the board baseline to deal with so many people question on it mm-hmm. does then someone that say a level six on their press and a level two on their squat they basically have to they keep their six it just motivates them to bring that squat up to a six yeah. before yeah. they can then move on so they basically have to just stay average at their say press because they have to stay there mm. because they can't pr- is that is that how that works so we, we, we uh, the analogy we use is like a tree, right? So we have the corner, we have the trunk of the tree, which makes up the syllabus. And then you can branch off that if you feel necessary. Because at the worst thing you want to do as a, as a coach is to kind of limit people into like mm-hmm. what they can and can't coach, you know? So you don't want to, you want to keep autonomy within coaching. I think that's important. You don't want to, so when you're a new coach, you like the structure and you like being told what to do. But as you get a better coach, you like to have freedom and autonomy. So we wanted to kind of have a, a structure that was, rigid but also allowed for uh, autonomy within coaching right so 
yes, you'll have a scenario where that happens. Now, you can't wait forever and a day for someone to get from one to two and they're already mm-hmm. a six. So, so with that, it might need an individual case study where you come up with a program, you branch off a little bit and make make the right reason, yeah. you know, make the right decisions for that athlete that keeps motivated and all that because maybe his squat just can improve that fast or whatever it might be. So there is that element to it also um, that you have to sort of, take each case study um, and, and, and progress accordingly. And especially as well, you've got a sitting under 14 age group, which is the, probably the most interesting age group from a maturity point of view. You have p- players in that are plus and minus uh, biological age two, two years. You know, So you have a 14-year-old who could be biologically 12 and the same age group, you've got someone who's biologically 16. It doesn't sound like a lot of four years, but it's massive. At that age, yeah. yeah at that age, you know. Uh, so... You have to kind of consider that also, you know. Uh, so there's yeah. so like it, there's so many things you got to consider. It's so chaotic and it's so hard to understand. But if you don't have a bit of a plan and a structure, you're just adding to the chaos. So the the the, the movement stuff was this kind of a structure mm. to allow us a little bit of, you know, a little structure bit of chaos. order in the chaos. Yeah. yeah, a little bit of order in the chaos. Then for you to kind of have a bit more uh, attention to other things, I suppose, as a coach. Yeah, I think I really like that approach where it sort of blends the qualitative movement with some quantitative assessment that you're basically putting levels in on movement quality so you can actually track it and progress it over time because that is one of the hardest things working with movement is that it is hard to measure. So having some standards for people to see, like everyone can see when they're adding more kilos to the bar but they can't yeah. see when their motor patterns have improved so easily. So giving them those six levels, I think, is a really nice approach to to motivate them to to work on it. Um, yeah. On on a similar line, in football, I've heard stories about differing levels of um, respect paid to strength and conditioning over the years. You hear about these old school managers who are very stuck in their ways. From your perspective, given you've seen so much, you've had so much diversity in your career already, what are the things that football does really well and what are the areas that you think require most attention for improvement from an S&C point of view? Let's start there. Yeah, S&C point of view. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think... I think what it does well, uh, so this is SNC obviously on, on the grass now for a little bit. I think what it's doing is recognizing that the sport matters first. Uh, it's not trying to put in, you know, uh, fitness. I think we're getting better at conditioning players more than just, just working on fitness. You know, I think we were very much like, let's do a load of runs on the side and let's do a load of uh, fitness element, like loads of miles runs, loads of box of boxes and all that. And then like the football take care of itself. That approach works to a certain degree. Once you reach a certain level of fitness, there's no there's diminishing gains from it. You have to kind of understand the sport and understand uh, the, the the components of training. So, for instance, you'll have technical practice, you'll have possessions, you'll have games, you'll have tactical stuff, right? So you've got to embed yourself as a sports scientist, as an S&C coach within those uh, elements and understand what are the tools you have within your remit to change it. So if, say we take a possession, right? If we change the pitch dimensions, that changes the outcome the outputs of the game right so if we make a small pitch versus a large pitch there's different outcomes so there's qualitative changes and there's quantitative changes and you have to understand that uh when you when you add more players in take more players out add goalkeepers in put a floater in you know what a floater is uh, so you add an extra man you add in men to the game you add you know you change this you know, how the how the how the score is kept you know is is it is a cumulative score is it games is it how many minutes do we play it what's the rest time all these factors if you understand them and you embrace that chaos, you can make a training session really, really productive, physically, technically, tactically, and psychologically, as opposed to just seeing whatever that gives us and whatever that doesn't give us, I'll just run on the side, right? So pl- plug the gap, if you like. But for me, okay, that ticks a box and it's very safe and, and whatever else, but it's not best practice, in my opinion. The game requires them to be physically uh, it demands high physical outputs, but also with technical and tactical um, mastery of skill at the same time. So it's not just one. You, you, we don't just run in football. We run for a reason and we run with the ball. Or we run a certain pattern or whatever it is, right? So it's not all running. A bit like my thing at the start about metrics, how you get them is important as what you get as well. So I think SNC is getting better at that because SNC, that's part of the role of SNC in, in football. 
so you know so okay maybe a sports scientist but they're their blend sports scientists and snc is the same thing in football really um so uh they're getting better on the on pitch stuff of that off pitch i think we're getting we're getting better at recognizing that like strength doesn't always win strength is important you have to be strong okay we want to be have strong athletes we want to have powerful athletes but if it's if it's poor function if there's bad function there of an athlete then getting them stronger is not going to is not going to do it really so like you you one hit like you take a run for example what there's seven eight maybe nine times body weight going through the calf i'll never get the calf as strong as that in my life if i kept training every day you never would so if the function isn't there, yes, the calf needs to be strong and needs to manage the load, but the function has to be there in the foot, in the calf, that has to be dorsiflexion, whatever it is, you want, you want to go down to the nth degree. But the function has to be there, and I think we're slowly getting there, and I think we're getting better at that. Um, I think that's maybe an area that we can improve. And I think what we can improve the most is just the accountability around injuries. Like injuries aren't really getting much better now, whether that's... Um, whether that's uh, whether that's because we're we're measuring better or we're more sensitive in our imaging or whether that's just more, more games or whether that's because we've actually increased the demands of the sport and all these factors that play into injuries, we don't really know because so many factors have changed at one time. But injuries are on the increase, you know, are, 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 are not getting better as a result. And I think, I think if we could just accept that and figure out why, I think an injury isn't doesn't just happen. I think an injury happens for reasons. Okay, some injuries are, are are bad luck, and some injuries are contact, and some injuries are. But some injuries have happened because of the biomechanics. And if we can trace it back into the athlete, and we can affect the biomechanics, then I think we're we're we're, we're, we're at a better place. I think with the with the athlete. And I think that's maybe the area that we could improve on the most. Yeah, I think the the two actually probably blend together quite nicely in terms of. I heard a podcast from you about the difference between conditioning and fitness, which you were kind of alluding to in that previous point. And I think good conditioning carries over into the sport so that the biomechanics hold up in game. And mm. like you're saying that the injuries are happening for a reason. So if the conditioning and the movement quality is better in sport, that's actually the thing that stops the injuries happening. Whereas fitness, you can be super fit but actually unable to handle the demands of the sport so well in your body, that's where the, the mismatch happens and where things really go wrong. So, yeah, I really like the way you talk about that. Yeah, um, I think I think um, if COVID has any positives to it, 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 uh, it showed a little bit of that, that sort of as a study almost. So players weren't allowed to train uh, in lockdown, so they did a lot of fitness work. I mean, fitness scores, uh, some of the reports of the fitness scores of 5K runs for some of the uh, footballers was incredible, right? So got, there's PBs everywhere, um, world PBs even. There was yeah, unbelievable some dodgy Strava entries, right? I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there was, yeah, there was. Right? But players got fitter, right? Mm. Players got really fit. They went back to their sports, and the only metric that increased was injuries. You know what I mean? So they were less conditioned for the mm. sport. And we all know the type of guy that can run forever, put him in the pool or put him on the bike. He just doesn't match up to his fitness level. Uh, we know well, what's missing there is the conditioning element, the skill the skill required for that demand, whatever it is, cycle, swim. And that's kind of at the basic level. But then you add in the complexity of a multi-direction sport like football, 5K is only going to do so much, you know? Yeah, spot on. Um, so one thing I wanted to touch on today also was your role at Satanta. Could you tell us what is Satanta and what are you up to there? Yeah, Satanta College is a, it's an online uh, university, but it has a base in Ireland and it has a few bases now uh, across the world. So it's in South Africa, it's in India, it's in the UK, I think, very shortly. Uh, it's a very much growing entity and, and I suppose why it's growing so well is people like the online stuff like the freedom of when they can study they, they also it's a university that has has a, a nice blend of academic uh, lectures but practical lectures like i'm not an academic i would like to think i'm more practical uh, des ryan has come from arsenal he's he's the director of coaching performance he was at arsenal for many years irish rugby for many years uh he's been in ga so he's been around elite sport for a long long time and he's director of performance so that'll tell you that it's a very much coaching orientated sort of uh, organization. Uh, within an organization, I've done a bit of lecturing for a master's level, but more so they have sort of project work. They have like a performance, like I said, 
the, the Des is involved in the in the performance coaching. So um, or we went to India cricket where we kind of so in India SNC is like an unprotected um, uh, sort of role if you like a bit like nutrition is you know anyone can be a nutritionist you know so nutrition is not really that protected but you can't just be a dietitian so it's kind of like SNC in India a little bit so anyone could be an SNC coach really um, but it's like just making sure that. You know, you look at the sport of cricket, uh, it's an extremely powerful sport. Like the amount of force is going through this, the lumbar spine when you consider it as a top down and a bottom up driver in, in each fast bowler. So you got to make sure your SNC is right for that. You know what I mean? You, you don't want to be doing RDLs, which is going to put more stress on the spine and then go out and do like 100 fast balls, you know. So I guess the Sazanda's um, role was there it was to try and classify and try and educate some of the SNC coaches around proper formal SNC education. So that was a project that me and Des and a few others went out and, and did and, and kind of uh, collaborated the coaches on where they were and, and gave them kind of a bit of a, uh, what would I say, um, a strategy to improve, if you like, um, in their own practice. So, like looked at them technically, looked at them theoretically. And, and find out the gaps within the research and then are in their practice and, and try to help them. Uh, so that was that was good. So there's, there's kind of projects like that a lot with Satanta. And that's why I really like the organization. It's, it's, it's a blend of academia, academia, which you need, and it's a blend of practical, I think, which a lot of universities don't often have. Yeah, and I think in sport and fitness, the people that tend to work in those industries are very practical learners mm. but they don't like to just sit in the books they like to do and like to see mm. and i think what i've seen from the sitanta stuff you put out there just really visual representations of how the body is working that brings it to life and you can see yourself implementing the drill with a client or in a training session quite simply whereas yeah. talking about it or lecturing on a screen just doesn't um yeah have the same same qualities uh, Shane, mm. I want to. Um, I know we're getting close to time. One thing we like to ask all of our guests is a little bit more personal in terms of what is fitness to you as an individual, and what sort of training do you like doing yourself? Uh, I like beating Ash and CrossFit. That's my number one thing. <laughs> How do you know you um, like it when uh, this never happens? Maybe? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I am useless at CrossFit. Uh, no, I. Um, Fitness for me is kind of is, is now more health based. You know, it's about, about, about like uh, I think of my future self. I think of being a dad in in the, in the next 20, 30, 40 years. It's about being active. It's about yeah, just being pain free. It's about enjoying it. It's about um, yeah. It's all before it was probably aesthetics. So I wanted to look a certain way or whatever. But now it's more about health and and um, just enjoying it. I think more like like recognizing that I I have an opportunity to train. You know, some people don't get to train some people don't get to do what we can do with able bodies so um that's that's priority for me right now um, um and then what, what i actually do like starting the red pill mentorship got me into crossfit a little bit i quite enjoy it there's a crossfit gym near me which i'm which i'm going to join soon uh but i've i've done sessions obviously with you guys were a bit were a red pill i really enjoy that sort of um kind of i wouldn't say it's random because obviously there's a, there's a structure to it also as well but it's kind of like you don't know what you're going to get sometimes and I, mm -hmm. I quite like that um so yeah um I'm, I'm into um the red pill stuff mass like 3d movement lunging you know that I, I i just really appreciate how the body and it fascinates me the body so i'm interested in in that sort of things i suppose if, if that's a crude way of putting it no, I think it's important to enjoy it. I think that mm. does get underplayed when everyone's so performance focused that actually for health, enjoyment and fun is actually an important part of the recipe, I think. Yeah, gets that, that's for me. When I'm training the athletes, I have a different, right. <laughs> different mindset. But for me personally, that's, uh, I, I, want to, I want to have fun now. Mm. That's great. And um, where can people find out more about, about you, mate? I know you're running a mentorship. Could you tell us a little bit about that as well, please? Yeah, so I've just started a mentorship. It's been running now uh, maybe 18 months or a bit less. Uh, so I, I've, I've kind of recognized that some, some practitioners, and a bit like how I felt many years ago and why I did the Red Pill mentorship in the first place, was it was a bit of a ceiling to my knowledge and it was a bit of a, a limitation to what I knew and how I could help the athlete. And I remember just dealing with athletes and thinking, right, if someone comes to me with pain, I've got three options. One, stop doing the exercises, change the exercise, or go see a physio. And I didn't feel that was enough for me. So now I feel like I'm in a better place and I can, I can kind of take on that. I can tackle that a lot better. Um, 
So I basically started a mentorship with sort of that in mind and also what and knowing what the football industry is and where the gaps are and where the kind of areas of improvement are. So I started, I suppose it is more of a football mentorship than anything else, but it just typically, I, I suppose, I gravitate toward football people because it's been my background. Um, so yeah, I have six clients um, that do the mentorship with me. So we, we do uh, one-to-one calls and we do the group calls and we do like um just just scenarios within their industry that they face to try and flesh out some some better ideas or better options for them um but i've uh, it's running a cycle so two people will drop off in january so i'm looking for two more people that come in the new year to, to to do the mentorship so that's something that's running uh at the minute so yeah hopefully we get two more again so to keep up the the, the momentum of the program that's brilliant and where can people find out more about it and you yeah, uh, so probably the tags on social media like SDM Performance would be probably the main tagline on Twitter, Instagram. I have a website, www.sdmperformance.com. So there's ways I think SDM Performance will, will, will find me somehow, shape or form. Yeah, we'll put that in the comment box down below. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, mate. Thank you. Awesome. Well, Shane, we're up on time now, and I know you're a busy man. You've got a young daughter to spend some time with as well. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you no, so I much. Can for... on, I can stay on. I can keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can. I'm sure the missus would appreciate that. Yeah. I know, I know. yeah thanks a lot, mate. Yeah, I thoroughly thanks. enjoyed this. It was a really interesting insight into the world of professional sport. Something that is well out of my realm, and I, and I love hearing about it. And, uh, just how different or how not different it actually is to the world or mm. dealing with the real life people. Just as you say, it's a bit more specialized and to the point, but thanks a lot for your time. Really appreciate it. No, I really appreciate it guys. Great questions. And uh, it was a really enjoyable. them. Thank you, Shane, for coming on the podcast. Absolutely fascinating to hear about the ins and outs of elite sport and kind of the similarities that you see in elite performance and I think that's one of the things that I like to uh, that I really took away from that is just hearing how when you are looking at young athletes coming up through the ranks and like the things that you got to look out for that when they get to that top top peak that they're the things that you want to make sure they've got covered so they can really get the most out of it I also hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did I would really appreciate some feedback on our on Apple Podcasts you can leave a five-star review if you do if you are enjoying the podcast as always, you know, you can go over, head over to our website, lungeandlift.com, check it out for all the good stuff. If you do want to support the podcast, you can head over to YouTube. If you're not already, subscribe to us. We have 68 subscribers so far, so we're building, <laughs> but we know you've got a lot more of you guys, the listeners. So if you do want to head to watch over, as well as yeah, come, come and have a little butchers. So thanks a lot for your time. We really appreciate you, especially over this year. And well, we're coming up to our 100th episode, so can't wait for that. And if there's anything you would like to see, in our hundredth episode, do drop us a message either on Instagram or head over to our website and let us know there. But as always, thank you very much for your time and we'll see you next week. Cheers guys.